faith, spiritual values, moral issues, government, economy, education, work, responsibility. What we think about these depends on our worldview. Now, VCY America presents Worldview Weekend Radio with Brannon House. Welcome. Glad you're with us. My guest today is Robert Spencer of jihadwatch.org. Jihadwatch.org. Robert, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Brandon. Thank you. It is .org, not .com, right? That's correct. Okay, jihadwatch.org. Um, folks, we're going to talk today about a debate that took place last week uh, between Robert Spencer and James White. Uh, we're not going to continue to talk about the James White uh, controversy except for when new information comes up, and new information has now come up. And so we're going to deal with it. This is becoming a very big story, folks. Perhaps you don't realize how big. American Thinker just picked this story up on Sunday. It was their featured article, the very first at the top of the page at American Thinker. That is a secular conservative website that has, uh, well, the reports show over 4 million uh, visitors a week. It's a big site. And um, so this story is getting legs now outside of uh, our circles, uh, but now into the mainstream of conservative uh, talk radio, um, uh, conservative websites, and I understand more is coming. Uh, so this is getting legs. Uh, in fact, this is getting legs from across the pond. Uh, this is now becoming a story with many in Europe where this problem is of Islam is out of control, as you know, with, with uh, the terrorist attacks. Uh, we now know that Maghetto Radio over in Ireland, those two guys are now dealing with it for 90 minutes the other night, Paul Flynn. Uh, we had a great 90-minute conversation with Paul I did on Skype the other night. Uh, now, actually Friday morning, a night for him. Now I get an email this morning from the U.K. about the debate between Robert Spencer and James White last week on the Michael Brown program, uh, which I have not heard a lot about this debate from James White, and I think I know why. I don't think it went well for him, but you don't have to take my word for it. I received an email this morning from a Muslim in the U.K., and here's what he writes. And I w then went to his website and look at the fact that he, by his own website, says he's an apologist for Islam. He has a blog in the U.K. And he writes me this morning, and he says, Dear Brandon, I'm a Muslim. Please read what I have to say and think about it. Please stop attacking James White. I, as a Muslim, admit he did badly in the debate with Spencer. The guy clearly did not prepare for the debate, nor have any meaningful knowledge about some of the subjects being discussed in the debate with Spencer. As a result, Muslims will respond to refute Spencer's comments. A colleague of mine had already done so, and I may write a blog to add additional refut re refutation or refusion and rebuke material for Spencer's followers to digest. Sadly for now, listen now, folks, listen, this Muslim writes, sadly for now, we are reliant on figures like Dr. White at times as we just can't get a platform to speak to the fundamentalist Christian and right-wing American audiences. Sure, Dr. White is not ideal for us as he's lacking in knowledge and understanding as well as having a Christian missionary agenda. But put yourself in our shoes. Why would you not try to support the guy who is being fairer to your community? Spencer has regularly cut Muslim voices off, so we can't, cannot speak to the audience he's looking to poison with anti-Muslim rhetoric and Islamophobic misinformation. James has, although he censors and is selective in what he highlights, given Muslims a fair crack at the whip. But it does, but does it help you? But does it help you to keep talking about white? You're harming the opportunity for Muslim speakers, leaders, and scholars to have further discussion with James White and other Christians. If you truly believe your religion is correct, then why would you not welcome dialogue between representatives of your faith and Muslims? Brandon, there are many Islamophobes who just won't even listen to Muslims. At least White allowed and encouraged Christians to listen and talk to us. It, it increases understanding. Um, then he goes on from there. Please, Brandon, leave White alone. Focus on bigger topics like abortion and gay marriage. Now, again, we don't know. I had to say, is this a real email? And I went to his website and found him. And sure enough, there he is. And I sent it on to Robert. And Robert's been to his website. Robert, before we go to the first clip between you and James White and start commenting on this, 
That's pretty fascinating. This guy who has a blog where he says he's an apologist for Islam says that he's using white to reach out to, quote, Christians and the right wing and people in America and have a dialogue. And they know that white is not a good uh, fit for them. He doesn't really know what he's talking about, but he's the best they have now to have the interfaith dialogue. I can't believe this got dropped in our lap. It is sort of amazing, but there are several things that need to be addressed about it, Brandon. One is that uh, he is talking about deceiving people. He's not talking about having an honest discussion, because when he says that I cut off Muslim speakers, that's, there's no basis for that. Actually, I'd be happy to debate Yahya yes, no, or anybody else on uh, any other imam or any other Muslim spokesman on any relevant issues regarding the nature of Islam. Uh, and we would, but it has to be an even, hand, even level, honest discussion where both sides get equal time and so on, and there's not a biased moderator and all that. The uh, kind of discussion that Yahya Snow wants is where the Muslims are deceiving the Christians, and the Christians don't know that it's going on, and don't necessarily have any ways or means to respond. And that makes it very much more insidious what's going on. But to buttress my point here and to show that what I'm saying is true, you can go to Yahya Snow's website and see, as you sent me the link, the uh, laudatory article that Snow wrote about James White and noting that James White had criticized certain unnamed Islamophobes, saying that they were just in it for the money and trying to uh, drive a wedge between Christians and Muslims instead of having a dialogue. And this is, of course, directly, 100 percent, echoing the rhetoric of Islamic groups in the United States that regularly smear and defame people who speak honestly about the nature and magnitude of the jihad threat. And they say that they're just profiteers who are in it for hate and so on. For James White to be just repeating that uncritically without any substantiation or foundation is extraordinarily irresponsible and damaging to good people who are doing good work and exposing the nature of the jihad threat. And to show exactly how insidious it really is, the fact that James, that Yahya Snow is making use of it is an excellent indication, since the more you look around Snow's website, the more you see where his sens sensibilities lie, and you see that this is somebody who would very clearly want the uh, foes of jihad terror to be discredited. And he promotes Sharia on his website, does he not? Exactly. Absolutely. And so you have somebody who is promoting Sharia, somebody who is clearly a Muslim hardliner, and he gets an ally and aid in James White in discrediting his foes. And it's amazing. He's saying, please stop it because he's the best we got right now. We need him to reach into the conservative America's America uh, minds and churches and uh, uh, so back off. So uh, and, and again, this doesn't count all the other numerous websites we have found of pro-Muslim websites trashing us, you, you, me, Usama, Sharam, by name, pro-Muslim websites, and lauding White. I don't understand how he has, White has so many uh, of his people in his camp that can't seem this, see this, but as you know, they, they have, and instead of dealing with facts, it has been non-stop uh, character assassination, uh, but whenever asked uh, in social media by people, what have they said that's wrong? You know, they well this weekend it was well House called it an interfaith dialogue. Um, James White called it that. We have James White being interviewed by Michael Brown defending the interfaith dialogue. So yeah. they just make stuff up to say we're saying things that aren't correct when we have. But anyway, all right. Well, let's go to the first clip here, uh, and w this was from the Michael Brown program where the, the, uh, Mr. Spencer, Robert Spencer of JihadWatch.org, was debating last week. Uh, James White. We're going to play comments by both of them and then get your com uh, get Robert's comments about the debate as well as some questions that I have for Robert. Here's the first clip. Uh, in listening, for example, this is James to White. Dr. Cotty, one of the things he said that was fascinating to me is he said, well... I want you to notice what he said there, folks, to start with, and I'll back it up. Listening to Dr. Cotty. That's the first mistake. This is where he's getting his information from a jihadi preaching Muslim Brotherhood guy, but here we uh, who's for Sharia. Here we go. Uh, in listening, for example, to Dr. Cotty, one of the things he said that was fascinating to me is he said, well, the, the Salafi, the Wahhabi, um, they basically are like the Reformers. And what they've done is they've gotten rid of all of the later developments of tradition, saying this wasn't coming from those original sources, this wasn't coming from the, the, the people that were around the Prophet. 
and they've gotten rid of all the the, the things that, that provided a buffer uh, against this type of activity. And that's why they fight with each other. That's why they can't agree on theology. That's why they're they're in the, the mess that they're in, which is very similar to the arguments that Roman Catholics use against the Protestants and saying there's all these different groups, all these different perspectives, things like that. And so when we say, what is true Islam, we have to ask ourselves the question, do you mean, what is the view of Muhammad? Well, I don't know that anyone can know that. In fact, Robert Spencer has a book, Did Muhammad Exist? So if you question whether Muhammad existed, I don't know how you can know what he would have thought if he didn't actually exist. Robert, would you like to respond? I thought that was an extraordinarily weak point. I was really sort of amazed that he even attempted to make it. I mean, this is somebody who is supposed to be a Christian apologist. And so he must have come across people who say that Muhammad says and does a great many things in the Hadith. Uh, they're, they're multi-volumes of it. It goes on and on and on. I have 30 volumes of the Hadith here in my office, and I don't have nearly all of it. And he says and does all sorts of things. But the fact that they're written in these books it doesn't in the least mean that he actually said and did them. Now, the thing is, is that you need to know both. Any informed individual who wants to know what's going on in the world today, and certainly any Christian who wants to speak to, to Muslims about the gospel, needs to know in the first place what Muhammad said and did, or what Muslims believe Muhammad said and did, because that's normative for Islamic practice and law. But at the same time, it's also useful to know that these things are of very doubtful historical value. But the fact that they're of doubtful historical value doesn't change their content. I can perfectly easily say Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight against people until they confess that there's no God but Allah and that I am his messenger. And I can perfectly well say that Muhammad said, I have been made victorious with terror, and so on. And all these things are recorded in the Hadith. But this doesn't mean that there was actually a Muhammad walking around. It's a separate issue. And so for White to say you can't, if I, that if I doubt the historicity of Muhammad, therefore I can't draw any conclusions about what he was like is rather ridiculous. You can draw all kinds of conclusions about what Muhammad is like based on how he appears in the Islamic sources. But then the question of the historical reliability of those sources is another matter altogether. Okay. And we come back, we'll play a longer excerpt from James White and then Robert Spencer. Worldview Radio and WVW-TV is growing fast. With numerous radio and TV shows, we produce from our studios and we distribute. We just added four new servers to keep up with the demand from our audience. Therefore, on July 15th, our rates for new members to the Worldview Weekend Situation Room will be $10 per month. $99 a year or $149 for two years. Current members are grandfathered in at their current price as long as they keep their account current. You get four clubs for the price of one. Our Worldview Training Institute, you get the Situation Room, Worldviewpedia, and My Worldview. All the details are at situationroom.net forward slash join. Situationroom.net forward slash join. There's now over $121,000 and growing in digital on-demand resources. Again, if you want to be grandfathered in at the current price, you need to join by July 15th because after that, the price is going up. You can join right now at situationroom.net forward slash join. Situationroom.net forward slash join. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Glad you're with us. Robert Spencer of JihadWatch.org is my guest, and we're going to go now to a longer clip. Uh, this one uh, is actually uh, Dr. White already asked. This one is Robert Spencer, so we'll go to a longer clip of Robert Spencer in his debate last week. It was like an hour debate, but I think these few clips really show us what was going on, and we'll play it and then let Robert comment, and then have a longer clip from Dr. White, and then I have some questions for. Robert, so here's our first lengthier clip from Robert Spencer. Uh, actually, Dr. White already asked me a question earlier. Uh, what do you, would you say to Muslims who prefer the uh, Meccan passages of the Quran, which generally teach a form of tolerance, rather than the Medinan passages that teach warfare? And uh, what I would say to them, and in leading up to my question to Dr. White, is uh, to note that Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, the uh, great Sudanese Muslim theologian, was executed as a heretic 
by the Sudanese government, uh, which is the Sharia government, an Islamic law, a government according to Islamic law, in 1985 for preaching exactly that. And so what I would ask uh, Dr. White in, 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 in turn is uh, what would he say, how would he ask those Muslims that claim that they are Meccan and not Medinan Muslims, how would he ask them, that how, would, how does he propose that they protect themselves from charges of heresy from the mainstream dominant view that Islam teaches violence, among Muslims, that is? And that can he name, please, a school of jurisprudence or a sect of Islam that actually teaches peace and coexistence as equals with non-Muslims? Well, there are a number of things there, but I, I think the very question sort of establishes the thesis of the debate. Uh, unless you're going to say that the man who was executed by the Sudanese government was not a Muslim, then you have Muslims killing Muslims over disagreements on this very issue, which sort of is the point uh, of, of why I even agreed to do this. And, and that is, I know too many Muslims who interpret the history of Islam, not just the original documents, but they then interpret even the schools of jurisprudence in light of the history of Islam and the history of the development of that through the Abbasid dynasty and so on and so forth. There's, there's been a lot of theological... Look, if we can recognize that even the view that the Quran is eternal amongst the Sunnis, as I, I mean, this is a difference between the Sunnis and the Shiites, if we can recognize that something as central as that developed over time, and it was not an original concept, but came in a time where uh, came into existence over time. If something as basic as that can be the uh, result of the process of the development of theology, then obviously many other things can as well. And the people looking from our perspective backwards say, "Well, there's the process of development. This is the stream that I see uh, that I want to uh, be a part of that expresses what I understand of Islam." And so. The, the, the terrible thing is that the Sudanese government would act in that way and that the only place you can be free to have that perspective is outside of where Sharia becomes established. That's and why would argument. that be? Wouldn't that be because of the nature of Sharia itself? That would be because of the way that Sharia is applied. As you know, there's different ways of understanding and applying Sharia. The very fact that in African uh, Islam context, uh, up until the past what, 120 years? Well, actually, more like 80 years, I guess. Uh, there was tremendous um, uh, freedom, even amongst Muslims and, and Christians and Aboriginal tribes and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, but that was a retreat from Sharia. That wasn't Sharia. Seventy percent of all the uh, rulings are established by consensus, ijma, among the various schools of jurisprudence. Uh, the, in Africa, there were many areas where Sharia was not applied, but that wasn't some moderate form of Sharia. So I ask again, can you but, please identify, outside from one individual who was executed as a heretic, can you please identify a sect or school of Islamic thought that teaches peace and coexistence with non-believers as equals? Well, well again, peace and coexistence as, of non-believers as equals, of course not, because of the fact that you have shirk and you have the understanding of the ummah, and the division between the Dar al-Harb and the Dar al-Islam. But I'm, I'm afraid that you're utilizing that terminology there in, in somewhat of a uh, double entendre or something along those lines. There is no question that Islam views those who submit to a law to be in right relationship with a law, and they want to have God's law applied across the board. The question is, is there a proper way, or is there any way at all that a believing person can interpret those same historical laws in such a way that they, for example, believe that if you are in contract, if you are a member of another society, if you are under the laws of another society, that you cannot engage in rebellion against that society. And as you know, that has been a uh, decision that has been made many times in the history of Islam. Yes, in regard provisional until Muslims attain sufficient strength in order to apply Islamic law, it, as I'm sure you're also aware. So the question once again becomes, is there then a school of thought that rejects violence against unbelievers, that rejects the idea that one must wage war against unbelievers and make them submit as inferiors under the rules of Sharia to pay the jizya, to not build new churches, that kind of thing? There is absolutely no question that that particular understanding of the application of, for example, Surah 9, 
is extremely prominent. However, what I was trying to say, you said, well, that's provisional until something takes place. Well, what do you mean by, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking questions right now, uh, even though you've been making a lot of statements, but when you say that's provisional, provisional in the sense that this person is allowed to engage in active violence to hasten this, or provisional in the sense that they accept that in this particular land, this is the case of the law that comes to Yeah, well, actually, point. the rulings are generally that if uh, Muslims attain a majority, then they can begin to apply Islamic law. And some schools consider that it's impermissible to engage in jihad activity until that point, but at the same time, they're working toward that point. And so the and goal remains course, the same. And, of course, the reality that uh, all of these schools one of the important elements of this, where ISIS and the others have rejected these Islamic schools, which you haven't brought up, is the necessity of the caliphate, which is why ISIS is so fixated on the concept of the caliphate, right? Oh, of course. But see, this so is there very is different as well, that ISIS is not killing other Muslims because it's some sort of a non-Muslim entity. It's killing other Muslims because it believes that it's the caliphate and that all Muslims owe allegiance to it, and that therefore those who are not al allied with it are heretics or apostates, and thus under the death penalty for heresy and apostates. Which is why they also attack al-Qaeda, right? Well, this is the same thing, that al-Qaeda is a rival jihad group, and so obviously oh, but, but, they don't accept the caliphate, but they're both working from the same principles that one must do violence to those who are outside the fold. But, and that but, is the core of our debate here, that but, violence is core and is taught by all the various groups in Islam. And it's is not something that is only the province of one group or another group, and then there's the other peaceful groups, because we still don't have the name of any peaceful group. And that was their music <clears throat> that you just heard playing, not mine. But Robert Spencer just finished saying, we still don't have the name of this peaceful group. Uh, Dr. Spencer, you put the question to him like three times, which is really the thesis of the debate, was it not? Yeah, I kept asking it because it really was the whole, the core of the whole thing. What he was arguing was that Islam is multiform, that it is not any one particular thing. And I've seen him argue this at other contexts as well, that the core texts are so contradictory that you simply cannot generalize. And uh, my argument in response to that was that Muslim authorities can and do and have and continue to generalize about the nature of Islam, continue to make rulings about it. And so if what he's saying is true and that Muslims are perfectly free without fear of harassment from other Muslims or charges of heresy to believe that Islam is peace, then he ought to be able to name a sect that teaches peace and does not teach violence against unbelievers or the necessity to impose Sharia upon them by whatever means. And he could not name such a sect because there is no such sect. Which and means so then he, he, the lost, problem. he lost the thesis of the debate then, correct? Well, yeah, because the idea was that the, the, the what were we arguing? That the Islam is inherently violent, essentially. And so he could not name any form, any manifestation of Islam that has any kind of traction. I mean, one guy who's executed for, her for heresy, for believing what James White says multitudes of Muslims believe, that's not a really very good record. He can't name one sect. He, if, if he had been able to say, well, this group of Muslims here, they reject all the doctrines of jihad and say that Muslims must live in peace with non-Muslims on an indefinite basis. But he couldn't, because there is no such group. What about, you know, there's again these claims that we can't know the real Islam. Can we know the real Islam on the majors, uh, jihad, the treatment of non-believers, Christians, Jews, uh, their Jews are pigs, all these things they say, they're, they're swine, you know, they're monkeys, the things we see in the Quran, treatment of women, laws and apostasy, uh, as I said, anti-Semitism. I mean, they're, they're, have not been consistent teachings and jurisprudence on these subjects over 1400 years. I mean, there have, have there not? And, and, there and, have. and so can we not say that there is a real Islam when it comes to the majors? I mean, maybe some group says a woman can't drive, can't get an education, you know, has to wear where only her eyes are showing. Not maybe all the Muslim groups do this. What goes on in Saudi Arabia maybe isn't what goes on in another place, but isn't there a known real Islam on the majors? Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned in that long clip that you played, the uh, schools of Sunni jurisprudence 
they agree on 70% of all rulings. And so there isn't, and the 30% that they disagree on, these are not major things. I'll give you an example. All the schools of Islamic law teach that somebody who leaves Islam, who is sane and adult, has to be put to death. All the schools of Islamic law teach that. You're not going to find a school of Islamic law or a sect of Islam that teaches that the apostate, the person who leaves Islam, is to be left alone. But there are the Hanbali, the Hanafi school, rather, the Hanafi school of jurisprudence teaches that a female apostate can be uh, walled up in a room and kept there, imprisoned there, until she repents indefinitely, rather than being put to death immediately. This is the kind of disagreement, whereas others say, no, you give them 48 hours and then you kill them. And so this is the kind of disagreements that they have. These are not major disagreements. These are not disagreements on the core key principle. And so for James White to act as if this is some sort of an amorphous mass that cannot be characterized, it's interesting to note that that's the same kind of argument that's made by Muslim Brotherhood-linked Islamic apologists in the U.S., when they are dodging uncomfortable questions about Sharia, and they say people come up to them and, you know, they're resisting, they're, tr- they're opposing anti-Sharia laws in one place or another, and somebody comes up and says, we're opposing these anti these we're opposing Sharia because we don't like the stonings, the amputations, the institutionalized misogyny, the institutionalized discrimination against non-Muslims, and so on. And then the uh, Islamic apologist says, no, 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 we don't need these Sharia, anti-Sharia laws because Sharia is so amorphous and so multiform that you cannot characterize it. And these aspects of Sharia you're referring to are really not the whole, the whole thing or the real thing, and there are many, many other forms. This is actually purely fictional. Everywhere Sharia, everywhere Islamic law has been applied, look at Saudi Arabia, look at Iran, Pakistan, Sudan, it's pretty much the same. And it's pretty much the same because Islam is pretty much the same. Wow. My guest is Robert Spencer. You're hearing uh, audio from a debate between Robert Spencer and James White last week on the Michael Brown program. And when we come back, we'll hear another final clip. And then I have more questions for our guest, Robert Spencer, of jihadwatch.org. Great point by Robert Spencer about apostasy, and I think he's making great points here, and we sure appreciate it. Again, his website is jihadwatch.org. Some days, folks, we do a Bible teaching program. Some days we do a big worldview type overview and analysis or look at the philosophies of the world. Today is just a news program, a straight news program dealing with a news issue, the big topic of Islam. And my guest on this news broadcast today is Robert Spencer of jihadwatch.org. Hello, I'm Brandon House. As you know, a few years ago, we set out to be the premier biblical worldview radio and television network. And as you know, today we produce and distribute numerous radio and television programs from our Memphis, Tennessee studios. Each week we spend hours filming, recording, and post-editing these programs to make them available to you and Christians around the world at absolutely no charge. Please remember that we do not charge any of these broadcast partners, and in fact, we cover their travel and lodging. These programs are largely made possible because of your partnership with us through your tax-deductible contributions to the Worldview Weekend Foundation. Can you imagine the man hours required to produce these television programs, not to mention the hundreds of hours in studying, filming, and post-production we do each year? Then there's the cost of producing and distributing these programs. It includes the bandwidth we must pay for that our app, our Roku channel, and our website consume each time you watch one of our programs. We also have the cost of our computer tech, server administrator, servers, backup servers on the cloud, video player that streams each program, that's a monthly fee, flying our broadcasters in to our TV studio in Memphis to film and paying for their lodging and then flying them back home. So I'm coming to you today with a very special request. We need to generate $4,000 a month in additional ministry donations to cover our budgets and the projects that we are currently involved in that include all of these free TV shows, radio shows, and our free Worldview Weekend rallies. Now, if you're in a position to be able to help support this broadcast ministry and you're not doing so, will you please consider becoming a monthly contributor starting today? If you can't, we understand. But if you can, would you help out? We need 40 new individuals to commit to partnering with us in ministry at $100 per month, 40 people at $100 a month, or 80 people at $50 per month, or 160 at 25 per month. 
In all our years of ministry, I'm not aware that we've ever put out such a challenge. And we're not doing so on a whim. We've spent years proving our commitment, ministry results, stewardship, and doctrinal faithfulness. And I think we have a proven track record that now justifies this challenge. Now our ministry is producing eight television programs alone, as you know, not to mention all the free radio shows. So please let us know that we can count on you. You can set up a monthly contribution online at wvwfoundation.com, wvwfoundation.com, or you can send a check each month to Worldview Weekend, P.O. Box 1690, Collierville, Tennessee, 38027. You can also call in your donation each month at 901-853-8792. We're looking for some new ministry partners. Will you be that partner with us? Thank you. Welcome back. Glad you're with us. Worldview Radio, our website, worldviewradio.com, worldviewradio.com. Uh, as I said before the break, uh, sometimes we do Bible teaching, sometimes we do worldview, sometimes we do news. And today is one of those news days where we take an issue uh, that's in the news and we bring on an expert. And today's expert is Robert Spencer on Islam. He is a very well-respected scholar by many people I respect, including many former Muslims such as Sharam Hadian. He's also respected by Islamic expert and Arabic-speaking man who's translated the Quran from Arabic into English, our friend Usama Dakdok. He's respected by many people like uh, Pamela Geller, and the list would go on and on. He's a very well-respected expert in this field. And today we're discussing Islam, and particularly his debate last week with James White on the Michael Brown broadcast. Um, again, we've invited Dr. White onto the program to debate Usama or Sharam. He's turned us down. He did accept this debate. I don't think I've heard a lot about it from him, uh, and I think maybe I know why, because I don't think it went so well. And even before we started this program at the very beginning, I mentioned the Muslim guy from the U.K. saying, no, it didn't go well for him, but please stop stop going after White, because he is one of the guys we need to give us a doorway into interfaith dialogues with the conservatives and churches in America. Well, I'm, well, that speaks volumes in itself, does it not, when the Muslims say he is he's not doing too well, but we need him? Is this not is this Muslim in the UK who's got this apologetic website for Islam not making our case? I think he is. So again, a great news program and broadcast today with Robert Spencer of jihadwatch.org. Uh, let's go to our next clip. This one is about seven minutes and forty seconds, and then we'll shoot some more questions at Robert Spencer. Here's the next clip from this debate between Dr. White and Robert Spencer from last week. Well, what I was trying to uh, get to there uh, a number of times toward the end was uh, the reason that there is so much infighting between these various groups is because they don't have the same theology and the same understanding. ISIS establishes the caliphate because they recognize that historically there has to be a caliph for jihad to exist, and al-Qaeda specifically rejected that. If you read uh, the, the writings of al-Qaeda that they put out, they said that a state of jihad exists and there does not need to be a caliphate. And so my, my point was, isn't that one of the uh, demonstrations of the fact that this idea that there is a single one true Islam, there's lots of, lots of differences, and one of those differences is this idea of the necessity of the caliphate. Yeah, this is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the Islamic theology of jihad. Uh, Al-Qaeda declared that uh, there did not need to be a caliphate because Al-Qaeda was basing, was saying that it was a defensive jihad. In Islamic theology, since the ninth century, since the formulation of the theology of jihad, there has been the idea of offensive jihad and defensive jihad. Offensive jihad requires the caliph to call it, and the caliph has the responsibility to call it at least once a year. But in the absence of a caliph, there is, it's not as if there isn't any jihad. Jihad is, as I said very much earlier, bard kifaya, a, an obligation on the whole community. But if a Muslim land is attacked, then jihad becomes fard ayn, which is an obligation on every individual Muslim and does not need the permission or, or the call of a caliph. And so what al-Qaeda was arguing was not that there's no caliph necessary. They weren't going against traditional Islamic theology. They wouldn't have dared. They were instead just saying that we are in a state of defensive jihad because Muslim lands have been attacked. 
Osama bin Laden even invoked the presence of American soldiers in Saudi Arabia to claim that Muslim lands were attacked. But also there was Iraq and Afghanistan after that. It became a much easier case to make. Then ISIS, which comes from al-Qaeda, went with them one better. They didn't disagree with any of that exegesis, but they said that the caliphate was now back. And so they were able to declare offensive jihad, and the jihad did not all need to be defensive. So when a deceptive Islamic apologist like Yasser Qadi comes in to the U.S. and he tells people, there's no jihad because there's no caliph, he is being actively misleading because he knows full well that defensive jihad is something that is a responsibility of every individual Muslim if a Muslim land is attacked, and that that was al-Qaeda's case. But he fosters complacency and ignorance among non-Muslims who aren't aware of jihad theology by making it seem as if all these, base, all these various jihads around the world today are illegitimate since there's no recognized caliph. So when he actually uh, gives entire lectures where he contextualizes those, talks about both offensive, defensive, talks about the caliph, and then also includes the information concerning the necessity when you are uh, considered to be under contract, uh, you have a covenant of uh, oath of loyalty uh, to a nation and the relevance of that. Uh, is that just what he's giving to the, to the Muslims? Um, or was I just not supposed to be listening to those things? Or how do you, how do you have knowledge of, of his heart and intentions, even when he has to protect he and his family because ISIS wants him dead? I never claimed any knowledge of his harder intention. Uh, that's quite, quite... You just called him a jihadi apologist, didn't you? Yeah, well, that's what he is. That's obvious from his words, from, his, from what he has said. Uh, but the fact is that the ISIS has him on a list because he is affiliated with Brotherhood groups. The Muslim Brotherhood is a very large rival of ISIS in wanting to establish a caliphate of its own. They had their big chance in Egypt in 2012, and they blew it when Mohammed Morsi was toppled from power in 2013. And Muslim Brotherhood groups in the United States are quite extensive and active. As a matter of fact, every major Muslim organization in the United States is linked to the Brotherhood. So the Brotherhood organizations in the U.S. are able to fool people very easily by claiming that they, they, they condemn ISIS, they hate ISIS, they don't want anything to do with that caliphate, and that's all true. But not because they reject it in principle or reject the theology, it's because they're rivals. They want their own caliphate, and so of course they're going to denigrate ISIS, just like uh, Ford denigrates Chevrolet. So, so the... So, uh, it, it, for some reason, I've taken the time to actually listen um, uh, to, to Yasser Qadi's uh, lectures against ISIS. I didn't get the Ford and Chevrolet thing. Uh, what, I, what I got uh, was, was much more theological in regards uh, to historical developments, the idea of the, the Karajites and uh, the, the use of violence. And it, it, it wasn't anything about Fords and Fords and Chevys. Is that just simply meant to be deceptive? Well, I don't know if in case you, we're listening. maybe you misunderstood my analogy. What I was saying is they're both selling cars. They're both in the same business. They both want the same thing. They're just two rivals who are trying to get to it in different ways. And that's the same thing with ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood. And so, so, so the, the theological the, element was just meant to be deceptive. Well, as, uh, it might well have been. After all, we have to remember that Muhammad said war is deceit. And the Quran in chapter 3, verse 28, says that uh, you can deceive unbelievers. Uh, in, a, in a commentary on that verse, one of the companions of Muhammad, Abu Darda, says, we smile in the faces of some people, but behind their backs we curse them. And so that cannot be discounted as a possibility, certainly. But as I say, I'm not claiming to know his heart. Uh, the fact is, however, that Muslim Brotherhood is dedicated to the establishment of the caliphate. Groups that Qadi is involved with are connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's a perfectly reasonable surmise that he has no objection to the problem, to question of the, the establishment of the caliphate in principle. He just doesn't like the ISIS one because it's not in his group. It's a rival group. Would there be, would there be anything that, uh, that could be said uh, from any, anyone who's ever spoken at ISNA? Are they not automatically, by speaking at ISNA, connected in utilizing your terminology to the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, I'll tell you something. If I went to speak at a group and I saw a big Ku Klux Klan banner behind me, I would walk out. I wouldn't speak. And if a Muslim sincerely rejects jihad, rejects violence against unbelievers, wants peaceful coexistence, why would he go speak at a group like ISNA? If, so if everybody does know what it stands for. So, so everybody at ISNA, from your perspective, stands 
for violent jihad. I didn't say that. I said that the, a, a speaker who comes in, who may have nothing to do with this, but he should know, he has a responsibility to know who his sponsors are, and he sees that Isna has admitted ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, then he should know better than to speak there, unless he wants the association and has no trouble with it. So there's, there's always unanimity of perspective from everybody who's involved in every, every uh, conference that you speak at. There's unanimity between yourself and... No, of course and, there isn't, and, but you're, you're, you're okay. I think, perhaps intentionally missing the point. The fact is that I am held to very strict standards, as I'm sure you are as well, in this, and that if we are always tarred with associations with various people. If and that's where the program music started, and he had to cut him off. <clears throat> Robert, I find it very interesting that he continues to quote Yasser. When, when he, y uh, y uh, y uh, Yasser Qadi, gives entire lectures, um, you know, again, I, I, th I think he loses the debate for two reasons. Not only because I have a, a, a Muslim today from the U.K. telling me he's, he's not good at this, this is bad, but he's all, the, all we got right now uh, to infiltrate, you know, conservative Americans. Uh, but he keeps quoting this Muslim Brotherhood, jihadi preaching, Jew hating preaching, crooked noses of the Jews, the Holocaust didn't really happen, Holocaust propaganda, Hitler didn't really mean to do that. <clears throat> and then people say, oh, well, wait a minute, didn't he apologize for that? Uh, okay, so maybe he went over to Europe somewhere and laid a wreath or something. It's called, I think, public relations. It's called save your job, perhaps, at maybe the college he works at. I don't know. It's maybe called, um, again, re uh, Takiya, maybe, again. But if he's really sorry for those things, he should resign from Muslim Brotherhood and get out of Islam because go read the Quran, what it says about the Jews and them being apes and, and, and pigs. So <clears throat> the fact that he keeps listening to this Yasser guy and quoting him, that shows he's not an expert on Islam, does it not? Well, I had to be. I was amazed when he seems to be arguing that Yasser Qadi was against violent jihad, and yet the one of the controversies that I initially got into with James White yes, was yes. over Yasser Qadi's uh, audio tape that I posted at my website, Jihad Watch, where he is saying that the uh, property and the lives of the infidels can be taken in a jihad, and yes. so on. Now, he does yes. say there has to be a caliph, so I think, well, great. If he gets a caliph next week, we better watch out. But uh, James White seemed to be very uh, much more offended by the fact that I posted this than that Cotty had said it. And then he's arguing in the debate as if Cotty didn't say anything like that. It was extraordinarily strange. Uh, even worse, Cotty sat right next to White when Cotty actually falsely claimed that Pamela Geller and I had concocted that video and had uh, changed his words by manipulating the editing process and that he had, he had asked YouTube to take it down and that we had sicked lawyers on him such, such that he wasn't able to get it taken down. And White is shaking his head sympathetically. Isn't it, isn't it terrible that Cotty has to deal with us terrible Islamophobes? Well, the fact is Cotty was lying through his teeth. I had nothing to do with the production of that video, and neither did Pamela Gellin. And the fact that White goes along with it, I might not expect him to know when he's sitting next to him that uh, the guy is lying, but he should be doing his due diligence and discovering that he is lying about that, just as he's lying about Islamic theology, and then maybe reconsider all his uh, fulsome praise of this man. And why does... James White not refute the Muslim Brotherhood organization that he is, that Yasser Qadi is so connected to. Yes, this is another thing. This is what I was trying to explain to him, and I think you really don't understand what I'm saying. He doesn't understand simple analogies. Ford and Chevrolet are both in the car business, so they might run each other down, but they both agree on the principle: cars are good. Don't get a horse and buggy. Don't ride the tri train. Don't ride the subway. Get a car. And in the same way, ISIS and Al Qaeda both agree that there should be jihad and that there should be Islam reigning supreme and the non-Muslim subjugated. But they and have he, different ways of going about that. And uh, White is making much more of that than is warranted. Well, didn't White prove he doesn't even know why ISIS is after Yasser Qadi? Indeed, yes. So that proves he doesn't even know what Muslim Brotherhood, how Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda and ISIS differ from each other, does he? No, he doesn't know anything about that, clearly. It, it, this is not somebody I would ever go for information about Islam. But, folks, he's being pushed by so many as the expert. More questions, we come back. 
on this news program today with my guest, Robert Spencer of jihadwatch.org. You ought to mark it as a favorite and go there every day, jihadwatch.org. Register now for the Understanding the Times Worldview Weekend. Hello, I'm Brandon House. Friday night, November 3rd, Saturday, November 4th, we're sponsoring the third annual Understanding the Times International Worldview Weekend. This year's theme is Understanding and Preparing for the Terroristic Threats Against Your Family, Community, and Nation. Keynote speakers will include the following experts. John Gondolo, former FBI counterterrorism expert. His bio is very lengthy. You should read it. He's an expert. You can read his bio on our website at wvwtv.com forward slash live stream. We'll also have Chris Gobbitz with us. He infiltrated CARE in the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia area and came out with thousands of pages and documents that he says – proves that the group CARE, the Center for American Islamic Relations, is connected to such groups as the Muslim Brotherhood and others. You can find his bio at wvwtv.com forward slash live stream. Jason Pratt, he'll be speaking. He's an active duty officer in the U.S. Navy and an aerospace engineering officer. He, by the way, is also an expert in self-defense. We'll also have with us Clint Clemens. He's the owner of a tactical uh, protection company, full-service personal security company specializing in training individuals, businesses, private groups, churches, and schools, and the specifics of security and preparedness in the event of, well, a natural disaster or other emerging threats. And my friends, that's what all these guys are going to be doing, bringing their area of expertise to show you how you should respond if you're caught in an active shooter situation at your school, church, at a mall. Did you know that recently the Washington Times, April 5th, detailed that ISIS is calling on their members to attack Americans in indoor malls, indoor ice rinks, and even at swimming pools? Are your young people prepared? Are your kids prepared? Do they know how to respond if caught in an active shooting scenario on a university college campus? Because ISIS is calling for attacks on college campus and universities. How about at a high school? These are the times to be prepared. This is a great conference for families teenagers, church leaders, police officers, deputy sheriffs, anybody interested in their personal and corporate security. We will actually have demonstrations on how to be involved in personal one-on-one self-defense. Again, full details at wvwtv.com forward slash live stream. You'll not only be able to hear these speakers, you'll see their demonstrations, and then you'll be able to ask them questions via email. While we live stream it, Friday night, November 3rd, Saturday, November 4th, you can register now for $99, whether that's one person watching or a hundred of you watching. Get a living room, get a church fellowship hall full of people and take advantage of this one fee, $99 for Friday night, all day Saturday, regardless of how many of you are watching. Full details, wvwtv.com forward slash live stream. Hello, I'm Brandon House. I love my morning coffee, and at night, I like to have hot green tea. I also happen to like coffee mugs. I have for years. And recently, with the help of a company out of St. Paul, Minnesota, we have created our own WVW Broadcast Network mug. I think this is a beautiful mug. It's two different colors, a light blue and a dark blue. It's called a diner's mug. It's 11 ounces, and it's handmade. It's hand pottery made. And our logo, the Worldview Weekend Broadcast Network logo, is made separately and then put onto the mug as a separate piece. So it's kind of raised and 3D, kind of like a relief, if you will. You can check it out and see a picture of it at wvwtv.com forward slash bookstore. wvwtv.com forward slash bookstore. It's got the WVW Broadcast Network logo, and then it says WVWTV, and then it says Worldview Radio. And it's got a picture of the globe. I hope you'll check it out at wvwtv.com forward slash bookstore and order yourself one and enjoy your coffee or hot tea, and a WVW Broadcast Network mug. I think when you go to our bookstore and take a look at it, you'll be shocked at how beautiful it is. I uh, searched far and wide for a company that would produce for us something really 
professional looking, something really classy looking. And even my wife, who has very high standards when it comes to this kind of thing, was really shocked at what a beautiful mug it is. And in fact, we use them now oftentimes when company comes over because they are so uh, beautiful. They're really, it's really a pretty mug. So why don't you check it out, wvwtv.com forward slash bookstore and order yourself a WVW Broadcast Network mug. Maybe order two, maybe order it and give it as a gift. WVWTV.com forward slash bookstore. Welcome back. Glad you're with us today. A news program on Islam and a debate that took place between James White and Robert Spencer last week on Michael Brown's program. And we played clips today. And again, I think I know why I'm not seeing out on Twitter or Facebook uh, James promote this because I've been kind of looking. Have you looked to see if he's out promoting this debate for people to listen to, Robert? I did actually just now, and I don't see anything. I haven't seen him say a word about it. Well, I think if he thought he won the debate, he'd have it all over social media, would you not? Yeah, one would think. Uh, yeah. Certainly, usually people who win debates do that. I posted the audio at my website, and uh, that went out on Twitter and Facebook, but I have not seen him do it. Um, how about this one? Don't this, the, the, the Sunnis and the Shiites agree on the majors of Islam, especially according to Reliance of the Traveler, the Sharia law book? Uh, doesn't this prove that these groups within Islam have uh, resolved the big differences on the major issues of Islam, and, and thus we can know the real face of Islam? Well, Reliance of the Traveler is a Shafi'i manual, which is a, one of the Sunni schools of jurisprudence. The Shiites don't go along with any of that, but they really do in, in, in substance. They wouldn't accept the book, but they accept what it says in the main. There is tremendous agreement across between Sunnis and Shia uh, about jihad, about the necessity to impose Sharia, and so on. Shiites don't generally go in for the kind of lone wolf attacks that we see ISIS doing, and the, the you know some guy running amok in London, that kind of thing. They're 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 never Shia, but in principle they agree with the goal. So why do you? I mean, you can't read his mind, but don't you think James White's continued defense of Yasser Qadi with this passion that he has, this fervor that he has? Do you believe that he's been deceived by Yasser about Yasser actually being a moderate, and clearly not understanding that? that Yasser is Muslim Brotherhood and what Muslim Brotherhood really wants? I mean, is, is he become an apologist for Islam, James Well, White? you know, I do wonder. I mean, I was, like I said, I was sort of amazed that here is a man who is preaching, and it's entirely Quranic Islam. It's Muhammad Islam, and so there's nothing really remarkable about it. But he's preaching that uh, Muslims can take the property and kill the infidels in jihad, and He's preaching this and saying that the Jews and Christians are filthy, and James White is mad at me for posting it rather than at Cadi for saying it or believing it. And it seems to me, yes, that he's been charmed by Cadi. He's been deceived into thinking that uh, that he is a benign individual who believes in some sort of a benign Islam. And uh, after all, Muhammad said war is deceit, and I've never encountered more practice uh, and skillful practitioners of deceit than Islamic spokesmen. And I include Qadi in that, and White just got taken in, it seems to me. Mm, mm, mm. Are you shocked at the number of people defending this? I mean, here we are, what, 16 years after 9-11? Uh, are you shocked at the number of Americans that are offending what James White is doing with this guy? I'm, I'm stunned by it, quite frankly. I mean, well, I thought... You know, I'll tell you, Brandon, this is my world. Welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, it seems to me that, I mean, I report on jihad activity every day for 15 years now, and I've written 17 books on this. Mm. And I go around and speak all over the country and all over the world about these issues, and I still uh, encounter the same ignorance, the same complacency. And, of course, there is a determined effort of people who have much more money and much greater access than I do to obscure these issues and to keep people ignorant and complacent about them. So I think that the defenders of James White, uh, they don't realize, they don't know that Islam is not a religion of peace, and it's not so multiform as to defy categorization. And it really does teach 
warfare against unbelievers, and it really does teach deceit of unbelievers and so on. They don't believe that, and they've been told, what's more, that only really nasty, horrible people, racist, bigoted Islamophobes, they're the only kind of people who believe that. And so they're ready to believe what James White is peddling because it accords with the kind of things that have been hammered into the American people for a decade and a half now. And Yasser is a Sharia expert, correct? Oh, no doubt about it. I'm sure that uh, Yasser is intimately aware of all the aspects of Sharia. Okay, with that being said then, what about the news report? Is, is it true, first of all, the news report out of Minneapolis that there's going to be some kind of hotline to report people, a Sharia hotline to report people? Yeah, it's a hotline for the Muslim community to report incidents of Islamophobia. Now, the problem with that is that, uh, the, for one thing, an innocent person to be attacked, that's a terrible thing. And nobody sh- can or should defend that. Yes, uh, At the same time, it's also termed Islamophobia when somebody speaks honestly about the uh, motivating ideology behind the jihad threat. And so this is going to have an inhibiting effect on that and uh, make How people so? frightened to speak How so? out about it. How, well, how so? What, what could happen? People will be afraid. People will be afraid to speak out when they see jihad preaching, when they see jihad activity, because they'll be afraid of being tarred as Islamophobic. And so is this a, is, is, is this a government? Who put this hotline together? Yeah, this is a taxpayer-funded government initiative. The uh, governor, of, the mayor of Minneapolis, I believe it is, is behind it. Okay, so you call into a government hotline and report your neighbor for, <clears throat> for saying stuff about or having a blog maybe against Islam? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if I were in Minneapolis, I expect I could be easily reported just for reporting on jihad activity. And then they come and investigate you? Yeah, apparently. I mean, I don't really know what the next step is going to be. And certainly one would hope that there would be First Amendment lawyers at the ready who would uh, be defending people from this kind of spurious prosecution. Wow. All right, final question. My guest, Robert Spencer of jihadwatch.org, jihadwatch.org. Am I correct that basically we now are listening to James White put out Muslim Brotherhood talking points to the American people? Yeah, certainly that's what he was retailing in the debate when he's saying that there's some huge chasm between the uh, Islamic groups and that there is a uh, significant uh, percentage of Muslims who believe that Islam is peace and live that Islam is peace. Certainly there are many, many peaceful Muslims. Millions upon millions of peaceful Muslims, but they don't have any theological leg to stand on within Islam. And that is a crucial point, because the jihadis can and always will point to the texts and teachings of Islam to make recruits among peaceful Muslims. So it only fosters complacency to ignore and deny that. Wow. Robert, thank you for what you do for the American people to try to keep us having the ability to have freedom. Because Sharia is certainly a revolutionary system that will overthrow our constitutional republic. Uh, I appreciate all the hours you put into writing, speaking, traveling. I know your flight was delayed last night, and so you were up most of the night, and yet you still joined us. So, Robert, on behalf of my listeners, thank you for what you do, Robert. Thank you, Brad. Folks, his website, jihadwatch.org, jihadwatch.org. I hope you've enjoyed today's news broadcast as we talked about a very important topic. Till tomorrow, take care. This has been Worldview Weekend Radio with Brandon House. CDs are available by calling 1-800-729-9829. Or to hear an MP3 file of this or earlier programs, go to worldviewweekend.com. Views expressed may or may not be those of Worldview Weekend, BCY America, or this station. This program is a public affairs presentation of worldviewweekend.com and is heard weekdays on VCY America. This is Tommy Ice, Executive Director of the Preacher of Research Center. I'm excited about all that the Worldview Weekend Foundation provides for Christians who are interested in growing in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Worldview Weekend Foundation provides cutting-edge interaction through their daily radio program from the perspective of a consistent biblical worldview. The same is true of the weekly national television program, as well as through the free Worldview Weekend seminars and their huge amounts of information provided on their ever-expanding Worldview Weekend website and the great programs provided there. I encourage you to consider making a donation as the Lord leads to this great ministry that enables so many to understand and deal with the issues of our day.